birthday, Louis Armstrong. They're not going to get tired of saying that all weekend. Welcome to the Satchmo Legacy Stage. For those of you who are just coming for the first time today, uh, to those of you who have been hanging out all day, thank you so much. Um, we have been having all sorts of interesting conversations and talks about various aspects of Louis Armstrong's life in New Orleans music, uh, some of which will be dealt with in terms of Mr. Fertel, Randy Fertel here, who will be talking about saving the Holy of Holies, the Eagle Saloon Initiative, and the buildings on South Rampart Street, probably the most, would we say the most important? Most important. Most important yeah. early jazz sites in the world. So, uh, Randy Fertel. I'll be making a case for that. He'll be making a case for that, so. I'm already a believer. Well, thank you, and uh, I think I'm the first New Orleanian to speak today, so those of you who've come from far, uh, welcome to New Orleans. Um, before I get started, started as a board member of the Louis Armstrong House Museum in Queens, I'd like to say how much I am missing the man who, since the early 90s, has built the uh, Louis Armstrong Archive and made Louis' house such a delightful and re rewarding destination. Michael Cogswell, the House Museum's director, has retired, and he's not with us this year um, here at the Fest. Uh, the House Museum wouldn't exist without him, and Satchmo Fest, it seems to me, isn't the same without him. So uh, you should all go to the House Museum in Queens. It's, it's a, a real treat, but um, you won't see Michael there. So I'm here to tell you about the Eagle Saloon Initiative, which seeks to save the building at 401, 403 South Rampart at Perdido. Uh, my goal is to impress upon you how important the building is in the history of jazz. Uh, for one thing, as I hope to show, understanding the Holy of Holies in, in jazz history, South Rampart and Perdido, leads us to the mystery of mysteries where was jazz born? Or as the ingenue uh, earlier this morning in Catherine Russell's talk uh, asks, where did that music come from? I'll come back to that tantalizing question, but first, since not all of you were here last year when I presented on a closer walk the music history, the New Orleans music history site that um, is branded by WWOZ and was put together by a bunch of New Orleanians. I want to do a short, very short couple minute introduction and update uh, on what this music site is, music history site is. Uh, you, it seems to me y'all are the perfect audience and y'all should know about this site because there's a lot of great material on it. So. Um, a Closer Walk um, is a mobile optimized website about the music and cultural history of New Orleans from the beginnings of jazz uh, to the present through Bounce. It features an interactive map of music history sites that users can explore at home, on their desktop or laptop, or in the streets on their mobile devices as they navigate the city. A team of experts has written and curated the best available content about each location. Users can read descriptions by acclaimed music writers, see rare archival photos of sites in their heyday, listen to music and oral histories with artists, and watch music videos and interviews. Uh, here is the WWOZ's short introduction to the site. It's about a minute long. Down in that gym, man, it's me and my baby. We both going crazy. Bunch of it in heaven. I say, down in that gym. Come on, y'all. Everybody put your hands together. Let's fly down or drive down to New Orleans. Jeffertina, tra la la la. Oh la la la, tra la la la. Jeffertina, ooh la ma la wa la da la. Tra ma tra la la. Um, 
a closer walk, or we call it ACW, is the product of a community effort branded by WWOZ and digitized by Bent Media. ACW merged two synergistic projects. My own project to do a jazz history website or app uh, led by Kevin McCaffrey of E-Prime Media and Dr. Ira Padnos of Ponderosa Stomp to do the same with post-World War II New Orleans music, um, which then his part of the project was led by Jordan Hirsch and Amy Bussells. I hope you'll give it a try while you're in New Orleans or if Satchmo Fest keeps you too busy that you'll try it when you get home. ACW works in the streets or at your desk. As WWOZ's new general manager, Beth Utterback, puts it, if you can't be in New Orleans, let New Orleans be in you. Um, here's a, oh, so uh, a quick update. Um, we've been getting not just a lot of eyeballs, about 5,000 a month and growing by about 8% a month. We've also been getting recognition in the marketplace. We got a Webby nomination, which I'm told isn't an easy thing to get. We didn't win it, but we got a nomination. Um, and we got first place for digital innovation from the New Orleans Press Club. Um, we're not resting on our laurels. We're adding more and more material. Uh, there are eight new tour pages and 27 new locations. Now, here's a quick uh, tutorial on how to, how to make it accessible on your device. Um, if you go to the website, which is a closerwalknola.com, and uh, click on the share button, which on your device is probably at the bottom, but here on a, on a, la on a, um, on a laptop is at the top. You click on that uh, share button, and then on add to home screen, and it will appear um, as a little um, thumbnail on your um, home screen. So that's um, all you need to know to get started. Just did it. It's a snap. It's a snap. Yeah. Oh, by the way, it's free. So um, now last year at the Satchmo Fest, the lesson I drew in presenting A Closer Walk in my talk was the importance of the map of New Orleans, its geography, in understanding the birth of jazz. Just as you can't understand the federal flood that some people call Katrina without understanding the geography of the city, the levees, the bowl, the sliver by the river where we now stand, so too you can't understand the birth of jazz without understanding the distinctive neighborhoods from which it emerged. If the levees and the bowl are the most important thing to know about our floods, the, the most crucial distinction is that between uptown and downtown uh, with Canal Street as the increasingly permeable boundary. I'll come back to this theme. So um, downtown in New Orleans, it's all about the river, right? Uptown is upriver, downtown is downriver. And when I was growing up, downtown meant the CBD. But historically, downtown meant below Canal Street, which um, isn't south of Canal Street. That's, that's one thing that David Fulmer in his wonderful uh, novels of set in the, uh, in the jazz era, detective novels set in the jazz era. In one of them, one of the early ones, he talks about uh, going to Canal Street and turning uh, east. Now, Canal Street runs north-south, so <laughs> if you don't, if you're not looking at, if you're just looking at a map and not getting a sense of things. Anyway, so downtown means south, or excuse me, um, below Canal Street, and it's made up of creoles of color, uh, the offspring of free people of color, perhaps of slave owners. Um, these people were Catholic, they were perhaps French-speaking, or knew French as well as English. They were trained in trades and in Eurocentric music. They were readers of music. They knew how to read music. They, their, their goal was virtuosity. And it's the site of Storyville. Um, down, uptown uh, is a completely different world, even though it's just two blocks away. Um, it's, uh, 
these are people who have uh, come in from the country, run off the former plantations or the plantations by the white leagues when Reconstruction falls apart, uh, to huddle for protection in the cities, as Du Bois puts it. Um, they weren't Catholics. They instead went to spiritualist churches. Lewis talks about how he, he learned how to sing at the spiritualist church. He learned rhythm at the spiritualist churches. Uh, they were not tradesmen, but manual laborers. Uh, they were not readers of music, but what was called head musicians, because it came out of their head, not off the page. Um, they were not virtuosic, no, they were rag raggedy musicians, according to the downtown um, uh, Creoles, they, and their strength was improv improvising. Uh, Black Storyville, which there was a law promulgated um, or, or written in 19, uh, 1897 to go along with White Storyville, but it was never promulgated until actually 1917 when it, it, it was the law for just a few months and then the whole um, thing fell apart because of the Navy. So um, Black Storyville is uh, where Lewis grew up. And along that uh, edge of Black Storyville is Rampart Street, which was the district made up of a lot of Orthodox Jewish people from Eastern Europe, um, who had haberdasheries and pawn shops, as my family did, um, and uh, grocery stores, uh, Louis Armstrong, y'all know Zatarans, uh, Creole mustard and whatnot. Well, uh, in, in Satchmo, My Life in New Orleans, he talks about his mother sending him with a nickel, I think, to uh, Zatarans on Rampart Street, the 400 block of Rampart, uh, to get some red beans and rice and a ham bone. Um, so my job is to help you appreciate just how important this strip was in the history of jazz, the edge of Black Storyville. I show this earliest photograph from 1922 in part because I want you to see that um, 1116 Perdido. So the corner is 401 403 South Rampart, and that's the Eagle Saloon. That's my real focus today. But behind it was um, another building, which is no longer extant. And uh, part of the story of 401 is that the third floor, probably, maybe the second floor, but probably the third floor, was the Odd Fellows and Mason Dance Hall. And um, 1116 Perdido was also part of that uh, dance hall. It's a little obscure historically, but anyway, that it's it's a complex of of, of uh, nightlife. Um, I also will point out that um, next door, a building that is not extant, is was the Fink Loan Office, and that will figure a little later in my talk. And Cata Corner is the Fertel, one of two Fertel buildings on Rampart Street where my great-grandparents, uh, great-great-grandparents uh, had uh, pawn shops and, and other things. Um, here is a picture of this Holy of Holies strip. Uh, on the corner there is 401, 403. Uh, above it there to the, to the left is the, the Iroquois Theater which, uh, referring back to Paul's talk about uh, vaudeville, um, Lewis, we're not sure quite what year, but Lewis, and a young Louis, entered a talent show at the Iroquois Theater. It was a vaudeville theater. And uh, we're not sure if he was eight or 12 or so. But uh, right before he went on stage, he stuck his head in a flour sack and went on in whiteface. Now... Anyone who could call that guy a Tom, <laughs> an Uncle Tom, I mean, he was born to be a trickster and to make fun of minstrel. So uh, beyond the, uh, the Iroquois, the Karnofsky tailor shop and residence, the Karnofskys, of course, were the Orthodox Jewish family that pretty much adopted Lewis. Lewis said that he learned how to sing 
uh, listening to Tilly Karnofsky's uh, Russian lullabies. And then beyond that is the little gem, which is the only building amongst these that has been saved fully and renovated and is in use. It's a saloon. Um, so here's a building, Caddy Corner, from uh, 401, uh, and it's a Fertel building. Um, here's a picture just to give you a feel for the energy of Rampart Street, which was called the, Harl the Harlem of New Orleans. Uh, or maybe we should say it was the Lenox Avenue of New Orleans. Here's a picture of the 200 block. The Fertel Loan Office is right there on the left. And um, the Karnofsky family lived directly across from the Fertels in the 1890s before they moved up to the 400 block. Um, they, they were at 205. Uh, we had 200 to 208. Uh, I like the thought that my ancestors knew those generous people. It's not my impression that the Fertel clan shared the Karnofsky's generosity of spirit, um, nor that my great-grandmother, Julia, both brains and spine in the family, even knew her way to the kitchen, let alone uh, that she could cook the great Jewish food that Lewis, uh, or that won Lewis's heart and for which he... he or that starved David for the rest of his life. A family story, however, reports that he would hawk his cornet with the Fertels uh, after getting into trouble in games of Koch across the street at the Astoria Hotel, which was the leading uh, black hotel in New Orleans at the time. Um, and in fact, you learn in Al Rose's Storyville book that it was built in the early 1890s by Tom Anderson, the mayor of Storyville. So before there was a Storyville, the hot place was Rampart Street. Tom Anderson knew, knew where to do business, and uh, he moved over to, to um, the Basin Street only after Storyville um, was made law. Uh, my family was all about business, as my great-grandfather, Sam Moneybags Fertel, that was the moniker he ear earned on the street, uh, as he told Harnett Kane in the state's item, quote, they used to laugh at me when Mrs. Fertel and I bought property so far out along toward Rampart. They said I was crazy. I said nothing. They laughed, and end quote, they laughed not only because Rampart was so far from front of town, the riverside, the commercial center, but also because it was so near to back of town with the battlefield and Black Storyville, as it was called, that lay beyond it. So called the, it was called the battlefield, uh, according to Louis in, in uh, Satchmo, um, My Life in New Orleans, uh, it was called the battlefield because those bad characters, he wrote, would shoot and fight so much. It was also known as Black Storyville. His mother probably turned tricks there, or as the swamp, perhaps as much for its low morals as for its low ground. Uh, Louis grew up a few blocks away on Liberty Street and Perdido, a street that got its name during the Spanish colonial period because it was lost, Perdido, every time there was a heavy rain. Um, so here's a map from 1883, Robert Robinson survey. I think it's an insurance map. You see, um, I don't know if you can see the pencil where Rampart Street is. It says late circus. So I learned just in researching this um, for this talk that Rampart was once called Circus Street which is interesting. I don't know quite what that means. But um, here's that 1116 Perdido, that long building coming off Perdido, and here is 401, 403, what, I, what I'm calling the Holy of Holies. Next door is the Fink's loan office, and uh, there's the Iroquois and the Karnofskys. Um, now, how do you establish the importance of something? One is you can go to authorities. And John Haas, curator of American music 
at the Smithsonian has said that there is probably no other block in America with buildings bearing so much significance to the history of our country's great art form, jazz. That's strong. Then Don Marquis writes, many of the dances for which Buddy Bolden, the quote unquote originator of jazz, uh, many of the dances for which Bolden's band played or held at the Odd Fellows and Masonic Hall at, you see, 1116 Perdido. But this is where Bolden reigned. He played many other spots uh, and was well known at Lincoln and Johnson Park, which were up by Riverbend, but it was past Audubon Park. But it, was all, but it was along Rampart and Perdido streets that his reputation was originally made. Um, again, you can base it on the authority, in this instance, of the National Register of Historic Places, uh, who have, have granted us a plaque to put on 401 South Rampart. Um, or you can go to facts. There are the, the, um, a number of facts you can adduce to suggest the importance of 401. Um, the corner, it, was, it later became the Eagle Saloon, but first it was the Eagle Loan Office owned by little Jake Itzkovich. Call that because I guess um, big Jake next door, Jake Fink, was taller. Um, they both focused on musical instruments and uh, they were hangouts for musicians. Um, in 1898, um, the Odd Fellow in Mason's Hall uh, is established either on the second or third floor, and perhaps, um, maybe even more importantly, we're not sure, at the adjacent 1116 Perdido, which is not extant. Um, Bolden plays there uh, from 98 to 06. Uh, in 1908, uh, uh, Bolden dies in, is it 07 or 06? And uh, his Buddy Bolden band becomes the Eagle uh, Band, run by um, uh, Frank Dusen. But um, in, in 1908, Frank Duru buys the building, in op and, and because there was already a sign that said Eagle Loan, he just kept it, and uh, it became the Eagle Saloon. Uh, the Eagle Loan Office had moved to Canal Street. Um, more facts. The Bolden Band is renamed the Eagle Band because of its association, uh, that location's association with Bolden. Uh, everybody played there. Robichaux's Orchestra, Bunk Johnson, Willie Cornish, Peter Bocage, Isidore Barbarin, uh, Frankie Dusan and others. Um, and then there is the famous moment in Louis's history when he's arrested at 12 years old uh, for shooting a weapon uh, on uh, that corner. Um, Tad Jones, who we lost way too early, a New Orleans music historian, um, feels that the circumstantial evidence is enough to confirm that when he got out of the Colored Waifs home, he went to Jake Fink's loan office. Uh, the Eagle loan office was gone by 1912 uh, to buy that $5 cornet um, that the Kornofskis uh, fronted him some money and he paid the rest uh, in 50 cent. Um, so, um, and then in the 50s, it's interesting, it, it says, what I read is the 50s, Zulu begins and ends parades there. Um, Louis is king of Zulu in 18, uh, 1949. So is, it, is that 50s a loose um, date, or is it because he becomes Zulu king in 1949? I don't know. So anyway, those are some facts that suggest that this is really an important spot in jazz history. Um, I'd like to parse this um, wonderful painting by George Schmidt. Um, I'm the happy owner of it. Um, 
I bought it because I uh, was because of my family's. I bought it in ni- in 1998, um, mainly because I I was you know I had this connection to Rampart Street. Uh, I hadn't done the research that later went into my memoir, where I learned that um, that Fink's loan office was my great aunt Nettie's father-in-law, the guy who sold Lewis his first cornet. So George here is um, mixing up his facts a little. Uh, this is New Year's Eve, 1912. Um, he's fired a weapon. Uh, Lieutenant Holy Land, I love that name, seems resonant, grabs him and sends him to the Colored Waves home. Behind him is the Eagle Loan Company, which would have been the Fink Loan Company, but uh, George wants to evoke the Eagle Saloon next door. Um, the Eagle Loan Company is al- already by this time on Canal Street, so. Um, it's historically inaccurate, and, and uh, George is, is a serious music historian, but he wants to evoke that aura of the Eagle Saloon and Buddy Bolden and, and the birth of jazz. Um, and um, notice uh, the trumpet behind Lewis. He's trying to evoke the... Uh, Louis' destiny is is uh, in this moment. Uh, he's destined to learn the cornet when he goes to the Colored Waves home from uh, Professor Davis, and then he comes back to buy this instrument. So to honor my ancestor, I asked George to repaint it. Oh, there's the trumpet, um, and put Fink there, but he refused. <laughs> So back to the mystery of mysteries. Where was jazz born? Where did that music come from? Um, Now, most of us in this room know better, but the chestnut about where it came from is Storyville, and no less an authority than the Encyclopedia Britannica announces that it's believed that it started in Storyville. And the LEH, the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, which is a really strong organization here and does great work, um, their site, their encyclopedic site about Louisiana, says Storyville is often cited as the birthplace of jazz. Uh, they're hedging their bet a little by saying is often considered, but still, you know, they're they're inviting the the, the world to embrace this old chestnut. Uh, Charles Chamberlain. Uh, one of our best local music historians and uh, the the key writer on all the jazz uh, history in the Closer Walk uh, app, um, feels the need to debunk the legend in this one-minute video. Which should play. Huh. Oh, I guess I didn't, I guess I didn't get this one downloaded. Well, Trust me. <laughs> he, deb- he's, he, he calls bullshit on it. He uses the word bullshit. It's bullshit that Storyville is the, is the origin of jazz. Sorry, I can't play that. Um, back to that theme um, that I embraced last year, the importance of geography and in understanding New Orleans. Um, any self-respecting jazz historian knows better than this chestnut that Storyville was the source of jazz, Um, but still the legend has power. Um, How do you make sense of this sentence from the second page of Thomas Brothers' really fine book, Louis Armstrong's New Orleans? While he and the quartet were out on one of the biggest nights of the year, Hustling tips in the real Storyville, he was arrested for firing a gun and sentenced on January 1st, 1913 to the Colored Waifs Home for Boys. It, it gives me whiplash, that sentence. He's in Storyville, and then he's on Rampart Street. First of all, 
young boys could not be in Storyville without getting run out by the police. So that's one flaw, and, and Brothers knows this. But there's, there's such a power to that aura of Storyville, that, that notion that this is where jazz was born. Uh, and of course, it, the, the irony is that Brothers' whole book debunks this sentence. Uh, he knows that Canal Street is very wide and the cultural gap it represented was wider still. So, as I said, that cultural gap is Canal, is Canal Street and downtown and uptown. Uh, just so there's no mistake, Lewis himself reports in, um, in Satchmo, My Life in New Orleans, that they were on Rampart Street when he fires the weapon. So where was jazz born? Clearly, there's no single manger where jazz was born. But back at town, with all its saloons and honky-tonks and the Eagle Saloon and the uh, Odd Fellows and Mason's Hall, in particular, have a righteous claim as one of the birthplaces, indeed one of the most important. It figures particularly in the story I tell myself about the birth of jazz, how I make sense of jazz's birth, that it emerged from the confrontation and eventual, eventually the merger of downtown sophistication and virtuosity and uptown raggedy, hot improvisation. The tension between virtuosic form and apparent formlessness in various proportions continues to this day to define jazz improv. And by the way, it, it, it defines improvisation um, since Homer. Um, here's an account of such a moment of merger um, by one of the downtown Creoles, uh, George Baquet, an ancestor of uh, the Baquet who runs the New York Times. At Odd Fellows Hall, nobody took their hats off. It was plenty rough. All of a sudden, Buddy stomps. By the way, George Baquet's brother was named Achille. And, I mean, this guy couldn't be more French and downtown. Um, all of a sudden, Buddy stomps, knocks on the floor with his trumpet to get the, give the beat, and they all sit up straight. They played Make Me a Pallet. Everyone rose and yelled out, Oh, Mr. Bolden, play it for us. Buddy, play it. I'd never heard anything like that before. I'd played legitimate stuff, but this, it was something that pulled me in. They got me up on the stand, and I played with them. After that, I didn't play legitimate so much. So if jazz is born from the merger of these two cultures, conflicting cultures, this is a key moment. Not, not I mean, it doesn't come out of this moment, but it's, it uh, exemplifies the merger that I'm talking about. Here's another one um, that Don Marquis writes about in Search of Buddy Bolden. Um, Creole violinist Paul Dominguez indicated that nobody's playing was quite so legitimate after Bolden, saying, um, this is quoted from Alan Lomax's Mr. Jelly Roll, saying, Bolden caused all that. He caused those younger Creole men like Bechet and Capard to have a different style altogether from the old heads like Tio and Perez. I don't know how, how they do it. But God damn, that they'll do it. They can't tell what's there on paper. They can't read. But they just play the hell out of it. The way I explain it is jazz emerged when the Creoles brought their virtuosity uptown because they could no longer look down their more aquiline noses at the uptown blacks who were much more déclassé and um, I, I, I wondered if that uh, song about uh, that um, uh, Lady Day sings with Lewis that we heard this morning about you're, you're just a heap of trash, if that wasn't a conflict between Creole and black. 
um, she's certainly lighter skinned. Uh, that it, that they're, it's not directly about that, but they're channeling that issue, which is, uh, to this day, part of black culture. I mean, in New Orleans, there, there was a club called the Autocrat Club where uh, you couldn't get in if your skin, it was a black club, but you couldn't get in if, you're, if your skin was darker than a paper bag, called the paper bag test. So while jazz was emerging all over New Orleans, wherever formal virtuosity was confronted by the raggedy formlessness of apparent formlessness of improvisation, this corner has an important claim on parentage. The building has been suffering destruction by neglect for decades. It was ready to fall down. But the Moreau Foundation has finally released it to a band of crazy people like myself bent on saving it. And now, here's what you'll see if you go to, Port, uh, to uh, Perdido and Rampart. Here's the team. That's, I hope you can, yeah, you can read that. Um, though Zach Fawcett, who created this slide, uh, is really leading the charge, and he left himself off, so. Um. Oh, no, he, he did finally put himself in, good. Oh, sorry. This is um, a four-minute video um, of that that the Eagle Saloon Initiative put together to explain what we're doing. I come here late at night when there's nobody around. When people are in New Orleans, I bring people here. This is where we come to honor the ones who've come before, whose footsteps we're following in. This is like, for me, walking into the pyramids or uh, Notre Dame. This was the CBGBs of its day. This is no different to me than sitting in Carnegie Hall. I can't even think of a building in New Orleans that has this much history. The Eagle Saloon is a cathedral. It is a monument. That was the center of jazz. This is where it all happened. This is where the music that we play was born. New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz. Because it amalgamated the music from several cultures, particularly African, and that got mixed with rhythms that came from the Caribbean, the Spanish, the French, and the Italians, and it was the gospel. It comes from the heart. It's music from the soul. It's intangible. It's something you can't put your hands on. It's something you feel. This corridor was kind of like the incubator. And some of the original buildings are still intact. And the Eagle Saloon is one of them. Jelly Roll Martin played down there. Uh, he was the guy who invented the word jazz. Lloyd Louis Armstrong, of course, and Buddy Bolden. Maybe what Jimi Hendrix did for the guitar. There was before Buddy Bolden, and then there was after Buddy Bolden. Thought I heard None of the music that was created there stood still. It was Buddy Bolden stepping out into the street and playing with such a big sound that everybody from all the other clubs would come into the Eagle Saloon. Preserving something like that is, there's, it's, it's an obligation because the ancestors still live there. Thousands of cars drive past her every day. 
this place needs to be open. There has to be music coming out of those doors again. As you saw at the end there, the plan is to develop a saloon with music venue, uh, a music space on the ground floor. Uh, to run it, we are in discussion with the folks at Cure, a bar uptown that recently won a James Beard Award. Uh, the second floor will be a museum of sorts with rotating exhibits, perhaps curated uh, by the Tulane Art Department. And the third floor will be used by a youth-focused music education nonprofit. This whole project is a nonprofit, by the way. Um, whoops. So uh, here's here's those uh, here's another view uh, right now, and you'll see on that bottom right corner it says opening 2018. I'm afraid that was a bit aspirational, um, <laughs> but I'm hoping that uh, this time next year uh, y'all can head over there uh, after. Satchmo Fest. So, thank you for listening, and I uh, hope you enjoy your stay in New Orleans. Randy Fertel, y'all, give it up for him. All right, again, um, thank you for coming to the Satchmo Legacy Stage. Thank you, Randy, for you know not only that, but um, all of the efforts to preserve this building that I personally have a great emotional attachment to. Yeah. So after seeing it for years and years, uh, we have one more coming up. Um, the the moment you know one of the moments we've all been waiting for. One of the highlights of the Satchmo Summerfest um, is Ricky Riccardi is going to be presenting some of the rare movies of uh, and films of Louis Armstrong and video of assorted things, um, which. Uh, is always a lot of fun. Um, Ricky, the curator of the Armstrong House in Queens, uh, is going to come up here in a minute and do that. Um, so, uh, you know, take a little break, get some food, get your drink on, and uh, come back in about 50 minutes. Hello, this is Ashlyn Parker from the Trumpet Mafia. Welcome to the 18th annual Satchmo Summerfest, presented by Chevron and the Satchmo.